here we are. Here we are, and I, I will do my best to not have any gross mucusy sounds while we do this show. It's a, it's no actually promises. a new vocal effect you're testing, isn't it, Jersey? Oh, stuffed up nose? Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's going to make it hard if I laugh. <laughs> I'm sorry. God, that hurts. That hurts so bad. Uh. Good thing I got the mic set with that, you know, cone of, um, what is it called? I forget what that's called, that dynamic thing where, you know, if I go like over here, you can't hear me anymore. If I come oh, yeah. back, all of a sudden you can hear me. Because that, yeah, I'm going to be hacking and wheezing. Got a head cold. Yep. Price you pay. Price you pay for working with kids. Makes you stronger, doesn't it? No, it doesn't. <laughs> it tears you down. Uh, it, just, it just beats you up. So, hey, Rob. Hey, Jersey. Jersey Droz. I was comicsaregreat.com and uh, instructor at leanintoart.com and co-dean and all that kind of awesome stuff. You've been doing a lot of teaching at uh, um, Lean Into Art also. Um, 30 classes in 30 days. That's right. It's underway. Yeah. It's going better than I expected. I mean, in terms of like the experience of the classes and everything. I mean, I didn't expect it to be bad, but mm -hmm. you know, you always expect there to be some kind of hiccups, or it's not going to be. It's always going to be ninety percent of what you wanted it to be. There's always that ten percent that you. Oh, if only it was just that much better. But I'm really pleasantly, or I'm really pleased with how these classes are going along. You know, I I, I sat in on Krishna Sadasivam's uh, creating crazy characters session. It was huge. It was, and, and it's cool how all the classes are building on one another. You know, so during week one, I did Comics Fundamentals uh, session one, mm -hmm. where the assignment was design some characters. And I was sticking mostly to uh, inner life stuff, right? Write a one-sentence description of your character, write a one-paragraph description of your character's premise or what the situation that they're in. And we're going to build on that for next week when we get into world building, etc. And then Krishna Sadasvam does this class on designing characters, building from shapes, and so the people who were there reported on, like, oh, this is going to be so great. This is going to tie in beautifully with the assignment I got to do for Jersey's class. So I'm really, I'm really happy with the way it's all coming together. Uh, but yeah, yeah, we had a question that we got in the emails. I don't know if we want to address it on the air for those who are curious about this thing, about time-shifted courses and whatnot. Uh, yeah, I think very good point. Um, I did not pull up the email in preparation for our episode, um, but well, essentially... The, 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 the gist of it was is like, can I sign up now and just take the time shifted courses? And and would the time shifted courses are they such an, are they such a way where it'd really be better if I took them live? What would, what would your answer be to that? Um, I also got the feel uh, maybe I added this to the how I read the question. It it's sort of will these have a long shelf life because I may not get to them all right away, kind of thing. Um, yep, that was there too. Yeah, so let's see. The, the live experience is definitely uh, a little more immersive, right? You're, you're, you are right there, and you get to interact with the instructor. And that's really how we've set up our service as, you know, that's the best experience. But you also interact with the instructors um, in the forums. And uh, even if you're in a live class, there may be some follow-up uh, follow questions, or some classes have uh, actual assignments, right? And, and and in the case of uh, the Comics Fundamentals course, when uh, the question came up of, well, how do you come up with an idea for a character? Uh, I said, well, I'll show you. You know, I answered the question live, and I said, throw a bunch of words at me of things that you think are cool. And they were like, okay, language, science, you know, abstract ideas. Uh, and they're like, oh, I'm sorry, this is really abstract. And I'm like, don't worry about it. I'll show you how you knit these things together into an idea for a character. And so I started doing word, a word association game and came up with the character on the spot. Uh, to, and, and somebody who took the class in a time-shifted manner said, oh my gosh, that part really helped me because I didn't even think about the word association thing. But uh, for the folks there, they got to you know, interact with me while it was going on, and then, we, and then I turned it over to them. I said, now you guys do it. I'm going to write down a bunch of things that I think are cool and try to knit these things together right here on the whiteboard. You know, just a quick, sloppy, loose exercise. So, yeah, I would say time, taking it live is the preferred method, but you still, I mean, it's still pretty good as a time-shifted class as well because of the assignments that are for follow-up in the forums, right? Yeah, definitely. It's, uh, I mean, that's another one of our core ideas. The, you, 
it's it's up to you. Like maybe maybe you're less comfortable affecting the live course of a class. But if that sounds interesting, you, we've got that option for you, and we've got the other option too, where where you just if you just want to sort of uh, see the results and uh, sort of you know interact in a um, in a more flexible way too, because obviously the live there's a specific time. It's it's a um, it's it's a meeting and a performance and a uh, class kind of all rolled into one. Right. Yeah, the scarcity in this model is our time as instructors, but we've I think we figured out a pretty good method where between the live class and then at, uh, attending to classes in the forums mm -hmm. are the two ways that we can bring like attend to that scarcity. Uh, and you know the attention that we give are, in either scenario is going to be different, which is why they're priced differently, right? So anyway, but yes, uh, and then in terms of like how long you get to access the material, I mean, how long do they get to access the material when they sign up, Rob? Uh, there's, there's no limit, Jersey. Uh, uh, what? Yeah, I know it's crazy. We're we're uh, we're we're wacky, uh, you know, uh, creative art instructors, and uh, you know, what do you know? Uh, you get to download it to your your heart's content. Put it on put it on whatever device you want. Uh, there's no DRM, um, that kind of stuff. Hooray! Yay. Hooray! Yeah, I, I would be more enthusiastic, but if I do, I'll start hacking. Uh, but it's awesome. So yes, uh, folks, if you are listening to this now and you're curious about what the stuff we've been doing, you can still sign up. It's at uh, leanintoart.com and there's a sign up link. And you can sign up for the time shifted courses or if you still want to participate in some of those live courses, the calendar of events is on the sidebar on the 30 classes in 30 days page and it's also available as a link. You can link to the HTML calendar, a Google calendar underneath the 30 classes and 30, 30 days uh, information. Find out what's going on and what's worth taking for you. So, uh, hey, how was Mix? <laughs> Mix was cool. I mean, it was a whirlwind weekend. Uh, just happened, uh, what, uh, this last weekend, November uh, 5th and 6th, 2011. Uh, this was the second uh, Minneapolis Indie Expo, and it's a, uh, it's a very, very indie publishing-focused uh, uh, gathering of a whole lot of uh, local artists from Minnesota, but also uh, from all over the U.S. Uh, there was probably some international folks there too. Dang. Yeah. yeah. So the public turnout for it? I mean, like, or was it? You know, I mean, was there a good turnout as far as like attendees and and characterize them for me? Like, what were the people like who attended? Uh, they were brilliant, smart, beautiful people that that uh, <laughs> they knew how to support the arts. Yeah. <laughs> yes, they did. Uh, no, it, it was. Uh, let's see. So mix is sort of in in a. Um, it's near uh, uh, the the University of Minnesota campus, but it's also in kind of an industrial area. That's a lot of it. It's convert. Some of it's converted to you know new um, lofts and living arrangements and stuff. Uh, and then some of it's still industrial. So it's this interesting kind of uh, uh, kind of neighborhood. Lots of um, uh, you know, it's a cool looking place, and it's in this place called a uh, uh, building called the the Soap Factory, which um, it uh, I I think right in during the Industrial Revolution, like they literally made uh, soap there, so animals would show up as animals and they would leave as soap. <laughs> and anyway, so there's aspects of the building. It has a lot of character. I mean, if you don't, um, they do a Halloween thing in the basement, which I avoided the basement. I was gonna ask. I was gonna ask. Has it got like kind of like a, a Texas Chainsaw Massacre look on the inside? <laughs> There's a little bit of that. First, uh, oh no, if you're not thinking of it. It's like wow, this building has a lot of character. Wow, that's a cool wood floor. Wow, it looks like a lot of things were you know built or done here or something. Yeah, um, because uh, I mean it's you know it's very sturdy, but it's, so you can tell like you know generations of uh, hardworking stuff has happened there, right? And uh, but the the main space is like a it's like partially converted and even from last year they added walls in in different places and stuff um, and it already has mm. like the gallery style like they'd slide like moving walls into place to create different spaces and installations cool. or gallery stuff uh, for all sorts of events uh, so it's a neat place and uh, really really a fitting setting for a. Uh, um, <coughs> That. Take lots of pictures. Um, I took some pictures. I'm so I'm still bad at that habit. Um, I did take some. I'll I'll post more online, and 
How are you going to have memories if you don't capture them for your scrapbook? I know. I, 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 yeah, I'm so wired to think about what can I do or build at any given moment. I, um, or, or like what can I, uh, you know, I listen and, and watch and, and think and I'll sketch and I don't know. That's, it's just that those are more my habits, uh, as a far, instead of, uh, taking pictures. You're, you're more present at these things probably than Maybe. I am. Nah, I don't think so. I think you, uh, photographers and people taking lots of pictures, that's a, that's a good way to be present. Um, it's not like I assume, well, then again, maybe, uh, do you do a whole lot of those pictures where you're like, Hey, wait, stand by that, you know, that, that cutout cardboard cutout. And, uh, uh I I've, I've said it before. I hate the stand next to the thing pictures. I hate them. <laughs> I like candid pictures. I like candid pictures or I like hammy pictures, like somebody being an idiot or so, like catching somebody just doing something neat. Cool. Uh, but the stand next to the thing, I'm next to a boat. Look at me. You know, I, I'm really not a fan of those. Uh, um, Cool. Well, I've got some good pictures, uh, but not that many. I did take a numerous amount. A few of uh, cool things and, and people doing neat stuff. And I think a few were done of me like that. Both, for instance, like when I was doing, um, I did a workshop uh, that will be happening this month at, during uh, 30 classes in 30 days. But it has a little different feel live. Um, it's uh, turning jokes into comics, laughing Yeti monkey spaghetti. Um, I, I don't know. I... I think I have a thing where I'm probably going to have to name all of my uh, workshops progressively lo progressively longer. <laughs> so someday it'll just be a book <laughs> instead of a <laughs> yeah until a, yeah until it's like a Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy kind of joke where it's oh are we getting some serious latency? I think we no? may be getting some or maybe it's intermittent. Okay, I'm gonna hold my I'm gonna hold up my hand and. As soon as you see how many fingers I'm holding up, tell me the number of fingers I'm holding up. Two. Oh my Boy. gosh, there's like a three second delay. Hmm. This could be a problem. Okay. <laughs> this could be, yeah, a problem. Uh, well, well, we'll we'll roll with it. We'll roll with it. We'll see how far we can get, and if we go, we start over if we have to, or like cut and then you know do another take, or you know continue on. Okay. There might be some pauses bit. as we wait for each other. Okay. I'll try. Uh, okay. Well, Mix was so it. So it's thoughts. a cool event. Lots of, lots of indie publishers bringing like, anything from like posters to t-shirts to lots and lots and lots of comics. Um, let's see. A lot of people uh, just doing using tons of different methods to produce their comics. Uh, a lot of genres and styles. I mean, it really was, um, uh, you know, different artists following their own voice. Uh, you, you could find so many different styles, but I don't think you would find a lot of, um, uh, a lot of works that would, would seem like they were um, something you would see, I don't know. I, it's so easy to mention their their names, but like it's not like a Marvel DC kind of thing, or or inspired by that kind of thing. It's tons of variety. Hmm. What well, uh, any takeaways from tabling? Like, what did you learn? Any kind of new experiences where it's like, oh, this is the this this time I picked up this from tabling at a show. Uh let's see. I think there's sort of a balance with the. Uh, um, visual busyness of uh, I experimented a little bit with uh, um, I t let's see I have a black tablecloth and then I have uh, two like twenty dollar banners that actually I'll lay them across the tablecloth and then I have their same likes actually behind me so you can easily sort of see what's up and then I will separate products from you know Art Geek Zoo and those kinds of things and then babies love comics so sort of in their own sections. Um, and so day one is sort of like, that's like, you know, Rob's 2011 approach. Took it, you know, the normal way. But then the second day, took one banner off the table and then um, sort of m intermingled the products. So there just wasn't one one way to look at it. Uh, and uh, it's it had both positive and negative effect as far as... Uh, How so? Uh, I think because it just was less uh, less clear, like less categorized, like getting 
so if someone would get a first impression of, of what they see on the table and then look for that next impression, it's not like they could go looking down at the same section and then discover more as they sort of expand their what they're paying attention to on the table. Because as they did, it was, it was more shuffled, right? So it would be, hey, that's interesting. What? what? It, it, <laughs> this is, it's not like... Um, you know, discovering a, a, a something consistent and similar and whatever, and uh, and yeah, I think that affected my my second day. But uh, but still, I mean, I, I had good sales both days. I mean, it was um, pretty well intended, but it's not a, it's not like a thick, dense wall to wall people shoulder to shoulder kind of thing. Um, I've heard people okay. describe it as it felt had the feeling of SPX, but it's you know not not as much traffic. And in some ways, that's good because um, you can move around easier. Yeah, yeah. Actually, that was one of the things that I felt was kind of like, at least in my placement at SPX 2011, was uh, problematic was the fact that it was so congested. It was so crowded that people just wanted to get through. Oh. They just wanted to get through to an open area. You didn't want to stop because you didn't want to hold up the queue. You also just wanted to get out of the, the, the thick of it, you know? So I felt like there were times where when it got really congested that we suffered be from the fact because nobody was stopping to browse. They were just trying to get through there as quick as they could, right? Sure. Whereas when you have a little bit more room, then you can be a little browsy. You need, there's like this really fine line between not, not crowded enough and too crowded. And when you're in that perfect middle ground, then people will stop and browse and move around. But th there's a sense of excitement from all the bodies being in the room. Uh, when I went to Detroit Fanfare this past, uh, oh God, I don't remember how long ago it was, like a month ago or so, uh, they moved to a way bigger space. Their first year, they were in a smaller space, and it was really crowded, really high energy, really exciting. And then they took the same size show into like, a space that was like three times the size. And it just, you felt the energy just drop. It felt abandoned, even though it was the same or more attendance. But because they had more space, the aisles were huge. You could literally drive a car between the different tables. Wow. So okay. it's too big. So anyway, yeah, I, I don't know. It's, yeah, it is interesting how that works. I mean, there, it's a it's really challenging. I can see how it would be really challenging to organize a show and dealing with all that stuff. Yep. Um, which is obviously something you deal with firsthand. Um, doing things like kids yeah, read comics with, and yeah, with kids read comics and other things. Uh, kids read comics extravaganza and whatnot. Yeah. Um. Any other things? Any other final thoughts on the mix? Uh, no, it's really cool. I um, it feels it. It's like uh, being there. It's very satisfying. You can do and see a lot of cool stuff. Uh, you know, whether you're just browsing art to be inspired, but uh, you know, a good. Uh, it's a good community. I, I can't wait to see how it progresses, uh, because actually the the workshops too like. Uh, they just did a lot of like the whole show just was upgraded and there was more people there was more even though um, last year there was plenty of people too it just yeah every it just like uh, there's a clear progression I don't know it was hmm. um, and, and the, the the workshops too it, how they were you know, like really well set up and um, and really well attended so that was neat that's great. That's great that that more play, more conventions and events like that are moving towards that like that whole vibe of meet the creators, but then also learn something while you're here. That seems to be something in the zeitgeist right now. Is it's not enough to just casually enjoy something; you have to also get involved in it somehow. Uh, I love seeing that. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, we would. You know, <laughs> if we're doing a show like this, <laughs> of course, we're gonna get excited about that. Yep. We're not we're not doing the the fanboy roundtable comics podcast. So. <laughs> no, <laughs> I'd probably get kicked out of that. I don't. Uh, yeah, and uh, there's there's far too many costume changes I don't have memorized. So. <laughs> uh, which is cool, actually. I, I'd always uh, I, I I have friends who are in, into that, and if, whenever I'm curious, I, I just use them as like a living uh, uh, superhero encyclopedia. <laughs> just ask. <Yeah. laughs> anyway. So, okay, well, um, topic time? Yeah, topic No curveballs for me. I mean, I'm, I'm sure that you you probably don't have any curveballs uh, given that you've had a whirlwind weekend. and uh, Curveballs? What's this curveballs you're talking about? <sighs> yeah, 
And I don't even know if I could even strike one today because, uh, oh man, I'm, I'm still dizzy from all the medications I'm on. So I don't know how good I'm going to be, but I'm going to give it my best shot. I'm going to lean into it. So, um, just uh, quick aside though, like these curveballs, just, you know, in case, uh, you know, those that listen to the lean into art cast are curious what we're talking about there. Uh, Jersey and I actually purposefully try to ask hard questions of one another. And, uh, it's like a little, um, it's, it's a fun challenge both to uh, try to come up with those things and to try to respond to them. So, <laughs> Yeah, it, it, well, it's, it's good training on a couple levels. One is it, it helps us think on our feet more because mm-hmm. uh, we don't let each other in on the curveballs. Uh, and two is it, it's a good, very visceral reminder that there's no, we're not trying to get to any kind of definitive answer here. This isn't an advice show where it's like, if you just follow these handy steps... Yep. You're going to be a successful so-and-so. Just follow re- follow the book. Chapter 3 has this. Uh, so by asking each other diff- difficult questions, we're cornered into situations where we, have to, where we have to say, you know, I don't know. I'm going to have to think about that a little harder. You know, that's the idea. Yep. <coughs> so, uh, tell you one thing I've been struggling with lately. Evolving style, Rob. Evolving style. That's, uh, <clears throat> I may as well change that to my middle name. <laughs> but uh yeah and i i saw recently you've been doing well you've been doing uh some really cool character designs regarding um like masters of the universe and whatnot and they're just obviously a really yeah, new stylistic take on those traditional characters uh i chronicled this on a thunder punch daily uh episode 143 i think is what it was surprised by style uh and it wasn't a very collected and um uh clear essay, but it was my thoughts as of that day, uh, what I was going through. Because what happened was, is, uh, let's see, earlier this year, uh, I was really inspired by the My Little Pony Friendship is Magic show at how they took, they modernized the art style and they uh, enhanced the writing. They made the writing a little bit more full and a little bit more polished and, and uh, well well-developed, well-developed characters, and it speaks to a wide audience, and that's why there's all these grown men who are big fans of the show, as well as young girls and grown women. And so I thought to myself, well, well, wouldn't it be cool if somebody did that with He-Man and the Masters of the Universe, and I wonder what that would look like. And as usual with a lot of the things I do, it started with a casual thing. I did this drawing of trap jaw that's up on the screen for those who are watching the video. Um, and I just did it, like, it took, like, maybe 45 minutes total to do the quick ink sketch with the Pentel Color Brush Pen and then just Photoshop it real quick. And I just posted online saying, like, boy, you know, it, it was like a blog post, like, I wonder what it would look like if somebody reimagined He-Man and the Masters of the Universe and aimed it again at children, but wrote it for a wide audience, right? So it's ostensibly for kids, but let's do the same thing for He-Man, what they did for My Little Pony. And I loved that trap jaw image. I was really happy with the way it turned out. So I was like, well, I wonder what Merman would look like. I wonder what He-Man would look like, and so on. And I started going through these different reimaginings. And, you know, every time I posted one of them, I'd get like tr- three times the traffic on my site that I would on any normal weekday or even weekend. Like sometimes I'd post on a Sunday and I'd get like, you know, three, four times the traffic I'd get on a Sunday. So people were paying attention and I was getting a lot of encouragement. So I just kept going with it and I wound up going through most of the main characters in Eternia and started moving on to the She-Ra characters. Well, uh, and, and, and the whole style was about like designing something that would be very easy to animate but looks dynamic, looks unique, is bright and vibrant, right? Something that speaks to me. Uh, and I was just doing it for my own pleasure. I mean, because I can't make any money off of these sketches. Uh, so Kim Holm of Cartoonarchy.com uh, last week or the week before uh, posted something on Twitter about how he read my graphic novel, which I got right here, so it's a video, I might as well take advantage of it. Front Rebirth, available at finer websites like comicsaregreat.com, everywhere. Um, he read it and he said, I like the characters, like the premise, like the concept, didn't like the comic. And, you know, without pushing too hard on that because i mean you know it didn't really offend me i know that I, I respect his opinion and if he didn't like it he didn't like it uh but you know after a little bit of prodding he told me like oh i just like to see you do the comic in your new style quote unquote meaning the style i was using on the he-man reimaginings and this is where i get to one of the first bullet points that i want to like kind of chew on with you is that that caught me off guard when he said your new style because i was like my new style mm-hmm. it's just a style right i don't consider myself having any one canonical style because I'm a freelance illustrator and I do lots of different kinds of stuff. I've got some of my examples here. I'm going to go back and forth on this, but 
right? So like here's like some of the freelance stuff I've done, some pencils from a project uh, that I did for Glencoe McGraw Hill, and then what I did for uh, what is that? Marvel Superheroes Squad thing. That's what it's called, right? Marvel Superhero Squad? I think so, yep. Yeah, so, and then I've done stuff for other comics creators. Like, I did this pinup for um, an image comic called Strong Arm, and then I did some guest work on a comic called Fans by T. Campbell. So, I've worked in a lot of styles, and I think that most freelance illustrators tend to work in a variety of styles. Uh, and, you know, I'll talk a little bit about style evolution. But So it, that caught me off guard. I was like, wow, that's my new style? Hmm. I don't know. But, um, so then I started doing these uh, character reimaginings, taking all my characters from the book and doing them in that similar style of the He-Man reimaginings. And the weird thing was is they started to, like, kind of come to life again for me. You know, I hadn't written these characters in years, and I, I've wanted to, but I just haven't had the... the the, the blocks of time necessary to really focus on it the way I want to. But when I started drawing them in this kind of fun brush pen style, this fast and loose brush pen style, they started to become a little bit more vibrant and loud and kind of uh, novel again, if that makes any sense. You know, they're, they're fresh again. Mm -hmm. So I started entertaining the idea of doing the next chapter of this story, uh, The Front Rebirth, in this new style. And I immediately felt a hesitation, uh, which surprised me. And I thought, like, well, you, you can't do that. You already established that this book, well, I can go to that image of the pages. And there's, like, the, the front rebirth style. Uh, there we go. You've established a tone and a look for this thing, right? It's black and white. It's aimed towards teens, and so, et cetera. Uh, you can't just change the look midstream like that. And then, I, and then I, I was surprised by my own surprise, right? You know, I was surprised at that. By, like, why wouldn't I? Why couldn't I do that? It's my book. I get to do what I want with it. And after all, you know, I've said many times that, like, uh, mainstream comics would do well to follow the model of the traditional kids' cartoon where Batman the Animated Series is one year, Justice League Unlimited another year, style looks different than Batman uh, Brave and the Bold. Totally different style. Why not iterate it out like that? Because cartoons do it, and they get a different audience every time. Why can't you do that? Uh, talked to some friends about it. Got a lot of hesitation. A lot of like, oh, this just isn't done. You know, you just don't do that. You don't do that to your audience. Uh, or can you? And then one final thought I'm going to throw out. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to just buckshot a ton of ideas and let you decide where you want to go with this, Rob. Is that in an artist's development the style evolves, right? Like, so here's something we talked about, I think, last episode, that Stranger Things book I did with Tom Root back in 1996. And you look at that style versus PPV to the left of that that I did in 2002 where I was aping more of a manga look, right? Uh, very different style. And then with the, the Calamity Kids book that I did for Glencoe McGraw Hill, I started playing around with uh, more open contour, kind of smooth contour lines with less detail in the middle. Uh, and then, same with this fans book. So I've been playing around with lots of different styles for years. And the Tiny Hamilton, where it's even more simplified, right? L trying to ape like a 1950s cookbook illustration kind of style. <laughs> um, so I've, I've, I don't feel like I've been in any one place stylistically, but this book has been, right? It's had a, a, cons a fairly consistent look, even though here's like page like 9 from the graphic novel and page 203 from the graphic novel. You can see that Thirsty's look does change. He ages up a little bit even in, within that one book. Mm. Looks more cartoony on page 9 or 10 or whatever that is. So anyway, I don't know where you want to go with that. That's just like sort of what I've been struggling with is... And, oh, and then the, the capper was I talked with Ryan Estrada yesterday. Uh, saw him at the Comics Artist Forum in Ann Arbor, ryanestrada.com. And uh, I asked him what he said, and he just kind of, you know, almost bemusedly said, like, no, no, no. He's like, nobody should lock themselves into one style. He's like, I even think that it, uh, a lot of cartoonists who have creator-owned properties would do well to explore multiple styles within their property. Uh, because he said, and this was the interesting thought, he said, like, what's the most memorable Simpsons episodes? It's the one when they turned 3D. It's the one when they did something unique with the, with the style and it broke the, the mold of what was going on with it traditionally. Uh, the Simpsons couch gag, gag by John Kay of um, Ren and Stimpy got a lot of attention recently. You know, whenever you break the existing assumed rules, it gets a lot of attention. So how far can you push that, you know? So I don't know. 
I'll, I'll, I'll let you decide where you want to head with that. What's, what's the most interesting place to go? Oh, gosh. It's, uh, <clears throat> uh, I mean, obviously, it's a big topic. It, uh, it's interesting that, well, it surprised you that someone said you have a current style. Sort of something that seems right. somehow definitively, oh yeah, if Jersey draws something, I kind of feel like it's going to be, if it's this new fresh exploration, um, it, uh, it's going to be this certain style. And uh, that was surprising, right? Um, yeah. And is that, uh, what, what part of that was so surprising? The, the part that I've done so many different kinds of books currently, right? Like Tiny Hamilton I showed earlier. That was from the latest Tiny Hamilton, finished just a couple months ago. Boulder and Fleet finished earlier this year. Uh, in the last couple of years, I've, done, I've worked in so many different styles that I realized at that moment that I don't think of myself as having a Jersey Joe's look. Uh which is weird because I, I've I've said before, like back in the old art and story days, I used to say like, you know, I don't think that having an update schedule is as important, or having like a definitive character is 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 important necessarily mm -hmm. to a creator's uh, career, as long as you, there's an essential brand of you, right? Like uh, you can expect these kinds of qualities from a Jersey Droz comic, right? There's going to be x amount of this, x amount of that in a comic that's made by Jersey Droz, right? Just like how Spielberg sort of had like a feel for his movies back in the 80s. You knew that there was going to be a certain level of, of uh, schmaltz to his films. People were going to cry a little bit out of the sweetness or the, yep. the earnestness in his movies, it's, right? Yeah, somehow incredible. In some intensely sweet aspects, fairly family-friendly, yet maybe a little bit of a uh, little ominous angle in there, too. Just an interesting right. mix of that, too. Um, yeah, definitely so, an emotional ride. Uh, right, right. So, like, that's, like, what I always thought I had, was, like, there's, like, a sense of, like, well, that's the kind of, that story feels like a story Jersey would do. Uh, not any kind of one visual look. And as a matter of fact, one of the things I've been talking about for the last six months is, um, when I did that Boulder and Fleet comic, and I did uh, a comic called Captain Seriously for uh, a freelance job, and I did it all in the brush pen, and I was doing these He-Man redesigns, and they were all going really fast. I mean, I just I, I can crank out the material that uh, in that style. I started calling up my deadline style. I'm like, oh, this is going to be the style I do whenever I've got a hard hard deadline, and I just I gotta get it done. It looks good. I'm happy with it, but it's not my, you know, my my noodling style. Like the front, I would spend. Well, let me go to one of those pages. As a matter of fact, like some of these pages, and maybe not these ones necessarily, but some of them would take upwards of 20 hours to do. I should have pulled up one of the really difficult ones. Oh, I can put it up on well. the video. Video film. I mean, I can see how well the with the I mean the characters, even the one where they're standing go. in a circle. I know that would take me a freaking long time to do. Um, oh my god! Yeah, that, yeah, like that in one in the video, right? right. Yeah, yikes! Look, looking down at the crowd <laughs> yeah, at the giant converter tricky. Looking button. at down down in the crowd in uh, what is it? Uh, you could do it in two point. You know, you could have a vanishing point way above in the ceiling and then one off to in the distance as well along the horizon line, but. It uh, at least it's one point perspective, and you know, all those people standing there, all those tables. Yeah, that's a lot of work. That yeah, there were pages where I I put a lot of work into keeping it really clean and crisp and in focus and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So okay, so you know I didn't think of that being my definitive style or the deadline style being my definitive style. They're just different tool sets that I can break out. Okay, I'm gonna break out this toolbox for this job, this toolbox for that job. Mm -hmm. Uh. So that that was the first thing. It's like, wow, you know, and I thought about like that my reaction to that, I suspect it comes from the time I grew up in when Marvel and DC sort of had house styles and, you know, Superman looks like this. Spider-Man looks like this. You don't really deviate from that too much. Mm -hmm. But although each cartoonist, like say Sal Buscema, so I got the Sal Buscema Spider-Man coffee mug, he drew Spider-Man in a really distinct way. He had a very distinct inking style. Mm -hmm. And I love his style, but it still looked consistent with the overall Marvel Universe. But a Sal Buscema comic looks a certain way. It has a certain look to it. He has certain uh, visual, I don't know, symbols that he refers to constantly in his work, like a certain eyebrow wrinkle that he does that only he can do. Um, so I grew up in a world where artists sort of had like a trademark look to their work. 
Um, you didn't see uh, very often like uh, an artist who would work in a variety of styles. Like S- Steve Lee Aloha's work looked like Steve Lee Aloha's work no matter what, mm-hmm. right? So that part caught me off guard, and it, and I don't know, I don't have like I don't have any kind of like landing place of like how I feel about it. Like like oh well, the old days were wrong. We shouldn't feel like we have a style today. I don't feel that way necessarily. It's just, but I do wonder if. Um, this is something about like the liberation of comics in general because we're not confined to corporate house styles with franchise characters and we can do more things that a cartoonist has a little bit more latitude to explore a variety of different options in their works and, and, and handle a variety of visual styles, right? Mm. I don't know. Well, to me, I, I, I think there's really two different functioning perspectives in there as far as... Uh, so you mentioned Kim Holm came up and said, well, your style... So he's right. he you know he he's choosing to be in your audience and so maybe that's sort of an audience part of the equation right where yeah. he's tuned into something specific that you're doing for for you know your day in day out you've got a bunch of projects going on simultaneously True. so which one would necessarily be your style probably could be up in the air as far as what you right. uh, what you might think and I'm wondering if is that perception of style really something related to uh, an audience tuned into a specific thing? And so that's that's a hard part, man. Because you know when I'm looking at these redesigns, I don't know if they're any good. They look fun. I have fun when I draw them, and they, and I'm like you know there's like certain things to me as an artist that I'm getting out of it. Like on Galen, on this shot of Galen, the guy in the purple shirt and the tie, there, the right hand side of his body is defined by one line. You know, it's like, I just want to zoop, and there's the right side of his body. I love doing that kind of stuff. That kind of, like, simple contour to, to develop, like, an overall look of a body is super fun. I don't know if anybody else is picking up on that or if they even care. I don't know what they're getting out of these things, right? Because I can't read their mind. So what is it about the look of these characters that is the audience is responding to? Is it the simplified kind of swooshy look of the lines? Is it something in the energy of the pose? Is it something in the facial expression? I don't know. You know, I'd have to be a mind reader to figure that out. <laughs> sure. <laughs> you could ask, too. That's one way. Well, um, but yeah. obviously, but people say directly, whatever. I mean, it's very, it's imprecise, and that, that's, that's a big part of it. It's um, one thing, uh, they have this, uh, I don't know, very designerly feel, where I think a lot of, like, modern-looking art that has a designerly feel seems to go into two other different directions that I don't know the labels of the styles, right? You've got the ones that are uh, very angular and um, perhaps built out of simple shapes that have planes, and uh, that would be, like, Samurai Jack and a lot of of that kind of stuff. Powerpuff Girls. Powerpuff Girls, yep. But then Tartakovsky-looking, or Craig McCracken look. Yeah, and it, and I think there's kind of a generation. Uh, th- there's a lot of folks that are that are you know tapped into that similar feel. Um, but then I think there's there's other stuff that's a little more. Um, I don't know what to call it. I don't I make a noodle arm, right? So arms go like they don't have bones. Yeah. They just go right. anywhere they want to go, and they they the physics and bones don't mean anything. <laughs> Physics means something right. as far as indicating gravity or how hard something you know hits or might be whatever. There's indication, but but they, it's like the rules are different for for that style. But it seems to be a style. Um, and this is yeah. something, something that that's more in between. And so maybe people are just like feeding off of like, boy, that's kind of familiar, but it's exciting because it's different. I'll tell you, the two influences for this look that I got for the He-Man redesigns was, I was like, I want to go halfway in between the look of, like, the Kim Possible TV show. Did you ever watch that? I did not. Oh, God, watch it, Rob. It's so good. It's such a good cartoon. It's brilliant. If you, if you even if you even kind of like James Bond, and then but also like like just like rip-roaring superhero adventure, oh, my gosh, it's such a great show. It's, it's brilliant. It's a brilliant, brilliant show. Um, one of the best kids shows I've seen in the last decade. Cool. Um, but I wanted to borrow a little bit of Luca there, but I wanted to go halfway in between that and Popeye the Sailor, E.C. Seagar. Kind of like awesome. 1930s, rubbery armed, right? Uh, so that was, that was the inspiration. Like, how can I get in between that? And that's really where those giant forearms came from. Like, when you look at He-Man, 
Mm-hmm. Like how he has like the smaller biceps and the bigger forearms. That was really kind of influenced out of that. Like that kind of like uh, mis- misproportion of like when you look at E.C. Seagar's characters, they these tiny spindly little thighs and then these big, big calves and these big feet. And it just looks really dynamic. Like when they run, they look like they're like pounding the ground. Like when Bluto runs, he's really pounding the ground. So I wanted that kind of like kinetic feel to the to the look of these guys. So anyway, it's cool that you picked up on that. I did not know if that was coming across or not. <coughs> but anyway, yeah. so yeah, I mean, it's partially based on an abstracted kind of shape-based system, but also like this kind of like a, a, a grace to both the lines that compose the characters and in the body language itself. I've always been concerned with making my characters look as graceful as possible. Like I mean, when we look at this old front stuff, which is considerably stiffer by comparison, you know, I wanted everybody to always look like they're breathing, right? So, like, in that top panel on the top right where Rex and the boys are looking at Hook's shattered body, you know, Rex has, like, a slouch to him, and his legs are placed at a certain, like, kind of distance from him, or even, like, the replacements cover. So, oh, you're going back to the first one. Oh, gosh, um, that was an unintentional, unintentional scroll. <laughs> oh, uh, really? Yeah, it was, actually. Um, so, you were narrating. My I thought you were going there on purpose. Now I'm... Uh, 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 yes, I was going back. Thanks, Jersey. For okay. That. Well, anyway, so, like, I've always been, you know, very interested in graceful movement, right? I've always, Rick Leonardi has been a big, big influence on me, or let me put it this way. I've always aspired to be as good as Rick Leonardi at body language. There we go. I can't say he's an influence because that would mean that I'm getting anywhere near what he's doing. Uh, but hope springs eternal, and I always want to be there. Uh, no, that's awesome. But anyway... So I don't know. I mean, it just it seems to me that okay. So like one of one of my friends, a guy who I, I have a lot of I have a lot of trust in. I trust his opinion on my stuff. I'll just say his name. It's Hoover because I mean he's not listening to this anyway. And I already told him that I was mentioning his name on podcasts about how I was waiting to hear from him before I decided what to do next. And his words were, "It's just not done. You just don't change your style midstream like that. You got people who have a set of expectations about what you've put out about these characters in the past, and to suddenly switch would be like watching Transformers Gen- uh, season one, and then in season two, it's a totally different style. You can't do that. To which, and I don't know if this is a failing or not, but my reaction was, is, dude, when you say that, that just makes you want to do it all the more. Because if it's not done, then i got to find out why it's not done, and I want to try it to see if it breaks something, right? <laughs> the, experiment, the, the experimentalist in me gets really excited about that prospect. Sure. Allow me to subject myself to this, uh, um, <clears throat> this w- um, small basin of uh, shark-infested waters. <laughs> Let's see what happens. Yeah. Well, and the other thing I was trying to convince him of is that like, it's not like my, my livelihood depends on anybody buying these books. Not many people buy these books. Uh, I don't. I don't make any kind of real. I don't even make reportable income on front sales. So it's not like the audience is there to the point where if I lose them, I'm doomed. Right? It'd be a different thing altogether if this was a highly successful web comic. I was, you know, had like five million uniques a day, and then I want to shift gears like that. Holy crap! That seems dangerous. But for me, it doesn't seem like dangerous at all because a nobody reads the darn thing. At least not many. Uh, B. It's been so long since I've done it. The people who read the book when it was updating, when they were in high school, they're in college now. In internet years, five years is a long time, you know? Mm-hmm. It's, uh, well, I mean, so there's, we've seen examples of it. You, you mentioned uh, uh, different generations of Transformers. Maybe not from season one to season two, but uh, uh, the same world and property, many of the same characters can be represented. And uh, in the representing... Um, that reminds me of uh, you know uh, mentioning audience earlier. Uh, oftentimes, it's about trying to communicate to perhaps a new group of people. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. I mean, this is what I think makes uh, a, a cartoon series with their model so darn interesting. Is like you can have Ben Ten. Ben Ten season one is a lot different than season five. Hmm. Uh, they're evolving the series, and it's not like it's like it's not like Robotech where it's like one constant narrative. There's it, it's there, but it's it's a little bit more of an iterative thing. Uh, Robotech is a good example of you got, and granted, it was a special case because they were re- translating pre-existing animes and then sort of sandwiching them together. But you had Macross, Southern Cross, and Maspiata, right? They were all tied together. They were part of one big canon, but each one had a totally different feel and a bit of a different look. But 
the argument I was leveling at Hoover was, is that you look at Gen 1, Transformers, had a certain look and feel. Uh, then there was Gen 2. Then there was Beast Wars, where they turned into animals, and he's called Optimus Primal, for crying out loud. And what's this all about? It's computer animated? They don't even make the, the iconic transforming noise when they transform? What? And then they go to Beast Machines, which was totally weird. They go back to Cybertron, and now they have to meditate in order to transform. They have to get into like the Zen state in order to be able to turn into their beast mode. Um, and then we went to uh, Transformers Armada, uh, and then Energon and Cybertron, which were completely impenetrable and incomprehensible weirdness. Then it went to Robots in Disguise in 2001, where it was on Earth again. It was current day 2001. Uh, it built, a, it, it borrowed from a lot of the existing mythos that was out there, but it was not directly tied into anything. And so on. And then it went to Transformers Animated, where they rebuilt it again, where Optimus Prime is a low-ranking sort of like a sergeant in the army, or, or like a, sort of like a lieutenant in the Cybertronian army, but he's not the, the leader of all the Autobots. And he's kind of a, a, a screw-up. He's, he's had like a reprimand against him, and so he's been sentenced to doing like uh, uh, repair work on the outskirts of the galaxy. He's not even doing anything important. Uh, so all these different iterations are all, in my mind, equally Transformers. I love them all, well, except for a couple. But I love them all for their own values, right? Like they, Each one presents a very unique kind of value. And I don't have any kind of, like, uh, what was it called? Cognitive dissonance about that. I don't go, like, oh, well, which one's the real prime? They're all the real prime, right? Right. Uh, just because they don't share one common thread doesn't take anything away from me, personally. But... Hoover and many other trans fans have valiantly attempted to find the common thread to say, here's how these things fit into a timeline, here's how the canon works, and this is why this Optimus Prime has a mouth, this one doesn't, this is why this Prime's a low-ranking official, this is why this one's the leader of all the Autobots. Whew, that seems like a lot of work to preserve a universe about, around something. And I don't know, am I being selfish by saying that I don't, because I don't need that, I shouldn't, I, 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 my, my comic doesn't need to have that? You know, is that selfish of me? I uh, it's I don't know. It sounds it sounds uh, um, uh whatever. I mean, I'll probably sound over philosophical. It just sounds like you're being uh, honest with yourself as an artist, and that's just part of your voice. That's what you do. Um, that's the kind of uh, when I I mean, it's neat to find examples of uh, of of creative works that that are inspiring and sort of reinforce kind of uh, like what, how I naturally l will look at things, right? So I'm, and I'm guessing other artists go through that too, where like, yeah, that's a good idea. That's why I'm doing this thing. Like, for instance, um, uh, Art Geek Zoo. Um, I didn't throw an example in there. I should do this. Uh, uh, in, in yeah, let's the, look at your samples. Yeah. Um, uh, what's funny is I didn't grab one of the chibi ones, but I got inspired, and that's like a going really weird and, and sort of off with with your characters when you take something that, that has a... Uh, uh, a certain design aesthetic, and uh, uh, you know, definitely cartoony and, and uh, various abstract characters, some anthropomorphized and all this kind of stuff. Uh, right. Many anthropomorphized, both animals and uh, inanimate objects in the real world, like guitars and guitar pedals. Um, it uh, let's see, so it may not seem as weird, but. Um, Going from any style when it has a little bit of extra detail to Chibi, which has very little detail, and emphasizing our interest in cute and uh, infant-like um, shapes and relations to uh, invoke our feelings of, of uh, caretaking and stuff. Right. Um, yeah, it's an ex it's an extreme difference, and it can seem off-putting. But there was a, a record of uh, Lotus War is a is a anime series that. Uh, it it started out as an OVA, I think, sort of uh, in like the the mid mid late nineties, and and it essentially you know was released in in a, in a few different episodes that in the end formed a like a short mini series, and it was an overarching, fairly epic um, uh, action adventure in a uh, very uh, in a swords and sorcery kind of kind of world. <coughs> And then a few years later, they remade it. And what's interesting, the remake both is an example of how someone will take a, same, a, a new vision on the same story and reinterpret characters, and uh, we're just sort of saying, well, hey, that's okay. Things that 
And then what's funny is it's a hybrid because they acknowledge and reuse ideas that happened and occurred that are a part of the current timeline and then blow off other things in certain, in certain ways. That is that within the current story has its own consistency. As long as you don't worry about those inconsistencies, uh, they're not doing it to be purposefully uh, uh, annoying. It's basically they've upgraded the story and the parts that they didn't want to emphasize or wanted to re change or wanted to occur again so they could explain it differently, they just did. They did whatever they felt would be the, the better version of the story. And then, as a sort of a, I don't know, a palate cleanser or something, at the end of the episodes, they have this crazy, whoops, I'm gesticulating too much, hit my mic, uh, very chibi, totally silly, um, welcome to Lotos Island thing. That it's, like, it's a short, basically, that, that would totally make fun of their own story. Like, take characters and uh, that were going to very absurd things, even if, like, a character dies or whatnot, and then, like, he might show up in the chibi thing in a coffin, and then, like, they'll... I mean, <laughs> it's crazy, and, and, like, just That's awesome. Like, there's very little in the story that... that uh, it's all about having fun, basically, and, and uh, um, the, the drama is about uh, doing a... a, a an entertaining adventure series, and then the, I don't I don't even know. And, and then the other part, I couldn't even tell you why. I haven't uh, read enough behind the scenes why that why does Welcome to Lotus Island exist? And they, they do that, but it inspired me, and I thought, you know what? I want to have that flexible view on my work, so I'm going to do it. And I did have that resistance at first, where I'm like, uh oh, should I? Shouldn't I? But in well, the end, I don't know. It just felt natural. Sorry. Here's okay. There's two things to this that that are uh, interesting to me. One is is that if you open those doors, now that's one more area where you have to be super intentional, right? If you're going to allow yourself the flexibility to to oscillate between styles, then you have to know what's the right style for the right moment, right? Or right sure. chapter, right story, whatever. Um, so that's putting a little bit more responsibility on the on the author in that in that situation. Another thing I think of is that I wonder how much of this is a reaction to the fact that. 20th century media, oh, God, I hope this isn't too philosophical and too thousand foot this week in media kind of thinking, but I wonder how much of this is a response to the 20th century saw the commoditization of media and storytelling, right? Mm -hmm. Before that, stories were, you had tall tales, you had folklore, things that got passed around by word of mouth, right? <coughs> And so the Paul Bunyan legend we get is probably some kind of really loose approximation and amalgamation of a lot of different interpretations of that because everybody's going to tell it differently. And it, so you had to have it like a standardization in the 20th century because this is CBS and we're going to give you the same kind, you can expect the same level of quality control every week. This show, even if it's written by different writers, is going to feel consistent with the previous week's show and as we had like ongoing serials and whatnot, even more so. Um, I wonder if how much of this is like uh, sort of an artifact of that period, and we're going to see more of like a flexibility in an author's approach to something as we get more into things like things that become runaway successes like Homestuck, where there's all these different fan arts and all these different styles, and they're all equally uh, enjoyed by the fans of the of the comic. Um, hmm. And that raises another question altogether, which I know we won't get through today, is like how much of this comes into um, under the purview of, of fan contributions to a mythos and a canon, right? Are we going to see something where the author's increasingly losing more and more control over what is the most enjoyed aspect of their work, and uh, is it best for them to just roll with it? Uh, or, or, or does that, or is it like a positive thing where it presents them the opportunity to where they can be the one who drives the iterative nature of their work rather than trying to hold the door saying no 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 this is this is the definitive version of these characters and anything else that you see is a uh you know a second rate copy mm -hmm. but if i'm the one who's constantly innovating and iterating and exploring new styles then i'm the one who's setting that pace right i don't know i don't know if i'm just talking a bunch of nonsense because i've got a bunch of cold medicine in my head but <laughs> No, I don't. Th that, no, that makes a lot of sense. It is, uh, and it, yeah, that is one of our th kind of. Uh, I think it's a theme we're discovering as, as we uh, em em uh, embark on you know our our adventures that lean into art, and uh, 
I mean, we love the idea of uh, you know having a, a shared teaching and creative experience, and uh, all of us are learning, and some of us are uh, in a facilitating uh, instructor kind of role. But it's not like um, it's not built upon the assumption of hierarchy, and um, and and sort of trying to disincent participation and whatnot. Where some models of sharing content really are are about uh, trying to affect controls that don't really naturally exist, so we need to add them via, you know, legal protections, like copyright and whatnot. It's not like, sure. um, yeah, uh, let's see. It's not like I'm a hundred percent against or or for either way, whatever. I have a lot of trouble with uh, software patents specifically, but anyway, that's another topic. Um, but you have the uh, we had. Uh, time in human history where you had folklore and less of a ownership where you mentioned Paul Bunyan and what's funny yeah. is growing up in Minnesota um, there's a lot of talk about Paul Bunyan in certain areas of the state and, and being tied to the history of, of um, um, I guess the development of Minnesota but what's funny is many places take ownership in Paul Bunyan I don't know if you've noticed that I would guess that that's an effect of there's no central owner to that myth and that it was a cool story. A lot of people who settled in, in, in uh, fairly um, woodland areas probably Right, like don't. the Midwest. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so I wonder, you know, so myths like that, but then look at one of our, uh, look at something that's incredibly popular where it sort of transcends that, that sort of central media thing. Well, you know, a good example of that is Star Wars. Um, and there's an, there's some affordances to to encourage um, community creativity with that property here and there, right? They'll release certain right. content you can remix or um, audio files and things like that, um, because it sort of has transcended where it's the it's been around for such a long period of time and it's been shared and, ex and appreciated from so many different people, I, it probably would only hurt their centrally managed goals to be overly protective of it, right? But, yeah. Any, those, 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 um, I don't know. That, that approach to content has, I mean, it has affected us quite a bit and, and it, and it will, will continue to. And I think both as creators and what we expect of ourselves and as our audience and expecting what, what they can do. Like what would you do if, if someone said, uh, you know, this is a this is a cool style uh, that you have on, on the front and then they maybe um, sent you fan art that they, I don't know, posted on their site based on your style. Would you? Um, would I be upset? Yeah, what do you think? Is that you're asking? Yeah. I, I'm I'm thrilled for people doing fan art for my comic. Uh, and as a matter of fact, like <laughs> this is where we get into like persnickety areas. I always called it reader art because ah. I've always been I've always been uptight about the word fan. I don't like the word fan or fanatic because uh, it, it, it 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 and I felt this way ever since I first started doing comics. Uh, it, it introduces this notion of I'm the creator, you're the passive recipient of my material. Just enjoy. Right and come to me for more of this wonderful material. Don't interact with it in any way. Um, so when people send me like like a, a guest, like a, a strip about my characters or a drawing of my characters, they're interacting with it. They're not a fan. They're a reader. They're a participant. Uh, although you know, every time I get into that jag, I always encounter one person who rolls their eyes. Like, just shut up. You're getting into semantics. Just it's fan art. It's fine. You know. Um, but anyway, no, I'm 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 all for that kind of thing. Uh, I would get a little bit itchy if somebody was selling Jared T-shirts, right? I'd be like, uh, "Hey, dude, that's my character. I own the copyright on him, and uh, if anybody's going to make money off of his imagery, it should be me." But uh, ultimately, the internet's a big wild place, and that could be going on right now, for all I know. And I mean, without like a lot of diligence, which I don't have time for, I really can't control that. Um, so and then and then at the very least, if that were to happen, uh, at least I'm getting you know the characters being exposed to people. It's yeah exactly it it is a tough thing. Um, it's really tough. I don't know I don't I don't have an answer on that. But uh, I do think it it affects our um, it's it's a part of this. I think w um, people being more open to flexible interpretations of styles. I would argue it's probably because 
it's like our palate overall. We're interested in some more new variety and some new spice as, as far as uh, um, remixing things and being more participatory because, well, we get a pretty uh, hefty demonstration of, of how that could be neat or interesting or uh, helpful to our day-to-day -day experience in the Internet and all the stuff going on with sure. people. Absolutely. Uh, and and the, the big question that I don't think we're going to have an answer for, but this is the one that I'm wrestling with, mm. is it's not enough for me to say, oh, it's never done, therefore I'm going to do it. Because somebody could also say, people don't just eat poison for breakfast. What? Really? All right, it's a challenge. I'm going to go, where's the, you know, where's the Mr. Yuck sticker? I'm going to put it on it, put it in my mouth. Put it on my toes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right? You know, th that that's the extension of that logic. You don't just do something because everybody says it's a bad idea. Uh, you don't take everything as a challenge that way. So mm -hmm. the next question is, okay, we acknowledge that there's advantages to maintaining a consistent style in your work. It sets expectations. It makes it easier to brand and market if you want to create any tertiary materials. If, if I, somebody sees a T-shirt of, of, with Jared on it, they're going to know whether I drew it or somebody else drew it, right? Unless the person is really, really good at copying. Um, so we acknowledge the advantages. Well, then what are the advantages of constantly iterating and evolving your style? Are there any? That's the, the question I want to I want to figure out. Uh, I got a feeling it's going to come out of just doing it, <coughs> you know. But uh, I don't know. I yeah. I mean, I I think you know that's a very individual an answer. For me, it's uh, I feel a tremendous benefit by being open to evolving my style because it allows me to proceed with creating and sharing. Um, yeah. Because uh, it's it's sort of a Adherence to a style, I would say, is probably a form of um, like operating in a criti critique mode a little bit, where you're saying, "No, I have to adjust to to comply to this convention I've I've already established." And you know, but that that said, though, I can totally acknowledge that as a as a possible positive thing too, because like limitations breed creativity. Setting yourself up with some limitations in a style also breeds, okay, well, how far can I push it? How far can I work within this style and still keep it fresh for me? I totally acknowledge that, too. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm actually scrolling your screen on purpose in this case. Uh, <laughs> where uh, there, Let's see. So you have a style which really does show a, a very you know, realistic proportions on, on, the, on the characters in, um, in the front. And uh, yep. you, you mentioned an early page versus a later page in the series, uh, on the, you know, earlier on the left and later on the right. There is a, um, by having the assumptions in your, let's see, by communicating the, the reality, you know, that, in that consistent reality and having you know, sort of people make those assumptions, like, oh, they, their bodies are a lot like my body and they've got a, you know, a forearm that rotates like this and whatever, right? That it's just, that's a skeleton. Yeah. I know how that works. Um, but then you can do ex exaggerations and, and uh, distort reality. And even though they aren't fundamentally in a very rubbery, cartoony style, you can still have that same impression, right? So you've, yeah, you you that's a, a, an example of how you have a, a style you adhere to, and it gives you a vocabulary, a tool set where you can start to um, communicate things with it. Mm -hmm. um, where uh, so it's not like it's. Uh, in the final panel on the page on the right, there's um, let's see, what's thirsty and uh, knock, Knox, yes. Um, so yeah, thirsty, thirsty is leaping into Knox hard enough where I don't know it's not. Really, oh, uh, yeah. Sorry. You're talking. Oh, thirsty's hugging Rex. Rex. He's hugging Rex and knocking him back, and the Knox is next to them, and he's saying something. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah. it's not like there's an extreme distortion of, of uh, proportion or whatnot going on. But yeah, I mean, there's enough where I, I can, you can see more energy. It's like, well, now all of a sudden they're, they've, they've collided in a, in a very <coughs> sincere hug, it looks like, from here. I didn't zoom in enough. Right. Yeah. So that's, that's uh, it adds more emotion to it. There, we can zoom in a little bit. Cool. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But still, it's it's fairly realistically proportioned compared to what I was doing with the earlier reimaginings, re right? Uh, totally, yeah. I mean, it's still in that same uh, basis, uh, that same exactly. I mean, where where this is, uh, um, 
it's definitely more they're they're abstractions of people right there's hands and arms and legs and what have you but uh far more uh, uh design focused right so I don't know. I don't know if we got anywhere with that, but it's something I'm struggling with, and I'm I'm certain it's something other artists struggle with as well. Um, I'll tell you what my plan is, hmm. and this will be the closest thing to a final word we can, I can probably get to this. Oh, what is going on? Why is it just scrolling like crazy? Um, I have a short story that I wrote a long time ago for the character Torpedo Black, who is on on my screen on the right. He's the guy with the goggles and little metal plates. Mm. And it's a sort of an origin story, how he came to work with the mercenaries. Uh, years ago, I was working on uh, writing backstories for all the different mercenaries. It was going to be called Tales of the Front. I did the origin of Jared, but I had the origin of Dick written, the origin of Orange Guy, and the origin of Torpedo Black. It's not a story that you need to know in order to appreciate the comic. But it's an interesting story because it's sort of like, okay, let's look at the world through Torpedo Black's eyes and see how he views himself as a hero and how he feels that life didn't deal him the proper hand of cards and how he reacts to that. Uh, and because of Torpedo Black, who is sort of like this kind of flamboyant, uh, super villainish guy, a cackling supervillain, likes to break things, there's a lot of action in it. So I thought, well, this would be the perfect story, a 24-page 20, thing. I'll do it in this style, see how it feels. It's me trying on the suit, right? If I don't like it, then I'll just go back to the way I was doing it. Uh, but if I like it, and I feel like it works, and I can get the, the moments of drama as well as the moments of comedy as well as the moments of action, then I'll keep going with it. Uh, and if I, if I wind up going back to where I was before, it's a failed experiment. But at least I got a 24-page comic out of the deal, you know? But so by, the bottom line is, oh, well, go ahead. Oh, so, so by by exploring um, uh, additional characters, um, characters outside of your 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 main, you know, protagonist or or you know, protagonist team and antagonist main characters, and whatnot, going to the the next tier and exploring them as main characters, um, that ends up possibly um, evolving your style. Or just being an experiment. Um, I'm thinking of it as just like a safe environment to to play with this thing with with something that is out of continuity in, to the extent that it takes place before the first graphic novel. Mm -hmm. So it feels like it, it could stand on its own a little bit more. Um, the origin of Jared was my first breach of my rules where I did it in color, and. I did this book, The Front Rebirth, in black and white. And so I, I really struggled with that. Okay, am I going to do the origin story in black and white or color? Black and white or color? Well, it really would benefit a lot from color. I'm just going to do it in color. The origin stories will be in color, but the main thread of the, of the story that I want to tell will be in black and white, just to keep that consistent. That's one of the things that I think was a broken way of thinking for me, is that it's a 20th century way of thinking, is that you have to keep it consistent, and the, the last volume should look like the first volume. Why? That's the question, right? Why? 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 Why would I need to do that? Uh, and if somebody has some good reasons, I'll listen. Mm -hmm. But uh, if there's equally valid reasons to not do that, first of all, it's my book. I get to do what I want with it. My characters, I get to do what I, what, what I want with them. And again, it's not like any money's hanging on this, so there's nothing. I don't lose anything by trying it. But just to be on the safe side, rather than committing to, because like the next story that I have written that I was planning on doing is a long one. Rather than committing to that, let's do a short thing try it on for size, stand in front of the mirror with it a little bit and look at how my butt looks in it. And if it looks good, then I'll go into the full-on thing with it. And, and, and if I decide after doing that one that I want to try a different style, I'll feel the, the freedom to do so. I'm going to do the next one in collage because that seems appropriate to the story. Um, so, it's, uh, it, so it's really just creative freedom then instead of um, um, I don't know or, or it's a, it, the freedom to adopt whatever stylistic limitations you want and somehow uh, exploring them so w why would you bother with all that work that's that acts that sounds like more work now as far as exploring what, doing that backstory so many new styles or possibly right so if you're if you're you know are adjusting oh. so many things why would you want to uh, why would you want to adjust all those things is you trying to curveball me? <laughs> uh, 
No, I mean, I got an answer for that. Is that for me personally? Is like, uh, what's the point of doing this if it's not fresh and new all the time? Mm. Uh, there is a level of professionalism that comes into being able to do something fast and quickly and to a certain level of expertise and quality, right? Uh, I feel very proud of the fact that when a freelance client comes to me and says, "Can you come up with a story about friendship involving six characters and takes place in the Arctic?" I can turn around within a couple of days and go, here you go. Here's a solid premise. Here's some really great characters that are fun to look at. And here's a really exciting adventure they can go on where some jokes happen and there's like a little bit of an arc and there's a little scary moment, there's a little fun moment and it all gets resolved. I can do that really quickly, right? And that's, that's like a certain level of professionalism everybody hopes for in their work. But if I'm not breaking new ground, if I'm not trying new things, if I'm not inventing something on the page or inventing something or discovering something about myself as an artist and doing it, it feels a little hollow to me personally, and maybe that's just because I have a, maybe I have a short attention span or something, or maybe I'm maybe I'm by some definitions not as professional as other people because I want things to always feel new and fresh and novel. Uh, but I don't want to be. What's that? What are I'm you laughing, laughing at? It's uh, no, I mean they're just they're, they're different perspectives. Yeah, I mean some some folks exactly yeah. would argue vehemently on either side, and it's in a nutshell. I, I think it goes back to our theme of the uh, um <clears throat> sort of a. 20th, 20th century mindset versus the 21st, where um, is your role in the overall uh, creative process and interacting with your audience and all that stuff very, um, very, uh, does it possess a lot of refined, specific edges and compartmentalized things that are purposefully compartmentalized and stable and will always be in that way because that's your that's what you'd prefer. The other way is just... Um, it's it's a little it's a bit more adaptable. Um, I don't think it's unprofessional at all, and obviously I have a bias toward thinking it's a it's a useful uh, mode of operation. <clears throat> but yeah, uh, well, but here's the other here's the other final word on this. I think, and when I say final word, I mean just like closing thoughts. Mm -hmm. Look at your stuff on the right. You're living proof that your stuff is going to evolve whether you like it or not <laughs> by <laughs> doing it over and over again. It's going to look different every time you do it because your work is going to change, right? Mm. Like, look at these early pages. Yeah, pages one, two, and three. I use different tools <laughs> and, uh, and uh, I, allowing those to, you know, inform the style as I was, uh, I was hunting for it. I really, I didn't know what it was, but I knew I wanted to tell a story. So it was time to get moving on it. <clears throat> and then yep. up to, yeah, 20... Episode 24 of Art Geek Zoo um, was another big iteration. I had a, uh, a creative partner, or 24, actually, for a while, and, and uh, all sorts of those factors. And what, So that was more Photoshop-based. Then I went to Illustrator, and then... In, so obviously switching from, you know, grad gradients and um, uh, yeah. a little bit painterly style where this is like more, more sort of uh, flat shading, but definitely shading to have some kind of 3D. Uh, and then eventually... Characters are becoming more abstract yeah. compared to what you were trying for in the first three pages. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. Uh, trying to... F yeah, so this... Yeah, it's been about trying to hunt for and find a style and whatnot. And, and eventually, actually, I, I landed... I was uh, pretty consistent with a style with uh, the round, you know, episode 75 through uh, 150 or so, or somewhere in there, 120. <clears throat> but um, it's uh, and and then that was fun actually to to you know try to uh, keep more consistent. But even there, it's it there was a uh, some subtle differences. Then I, I guess I was uh, less wildly fluctuating and and more looking to you know inc incorporate more of a of a dynamic feel with uh, you know expressive lines and uh, well speed lines and and. Uh, um, Interesting angles, yeah. and essentially try, and then then in trying to take on the task of well, can I pull off like a full page comic feel in a comic strip? What's that like? And uh, yep. um, so you know, at the storytelling level, too, think it became, um, and this is something that I I'll be applying in when I move on to chapter five, um, sometime in the whatever near future, um, it'll be, uh. In this in this style, when you're going for uh you know computing communicating roughly a page's worth of information in four panels or so, um, there's heavy trade-offs going on, and and I'm I'm gonna sort of switch the kind of trade-offs I want I want to do. I'm gonna give more breathing room, um, 
reading um, Akira Toriyama's Sandland sort of made me go, oh, moments. <laughs> okay, anyway, so yeah, constantly influenced by um, uh, developing skills and working on trying to communicate consistently and tell a story. Um, and uh, then both the story and the visuals kind of evolving simultaneously um, and sometimes discovering new needs and going, well, oops, I've that's now something I think of so much, It's now it's a part of my vocabulary. And I don't want to just forget it or, or ignore it. Um, feels good to me. Uh, yeah. So, and I, I've... I've actually posted a few times because of how much Art Geek Zoo has evolved that, uh, uh, well, you're on a ride with me. <laughs> um, I, I love telling the story, and if, if you're here to uh, hang out and uh, be part of it, um, yeah, I want to hear from you and whatnot, but um, be ready because things will be evolving. So, what were we saying before I so rudely silent on you? <laughs> Let's see, uh, you were talking about uh, progression of style and how the current uh, uh, current expectations with a lot of the modern media that we consume, uh, there's there's a lot of oh. precision there. And yeah, but even so, the writing changes because you've got a lot of writers in the mix and then as people get to know the characters, the characters evolve, the voices of the characters evolve, etc., so change is inevitable, um, and I, that sounds pat. That sounds stupid. That sounds like something out of like the movie Pleasantville, but it's something where there's this weird dynamic in the way creative people operate. At least this creative person, in that you are pushing for change while at the same time fearing that change, and and trying to. Um, Trying to control the change to some degree, and I guess that's a good thing. But oh boy, you think you just like shot me through the the art artist part of my heart as far as that? Yeah, you're right. You, you're you are right on uh, the desire to get heavily analytical, which can be incredible, incredibly useful as far as controlling a change and being intentional. But at the same time. Um, if uh, I guess it, uh, when I, I find my a analytical side will serve me well, if I'm um, if I can set it aside and, and just uh, uh, embrace it to you know help me get ready, but then let go and and uh, and just tell the story, draw stuff and uh, yeah, not be so yeah. editorial voice while I'm trying to create. The advice I hear from everybody who has ever achieved any kind of level of success with their work is they always say, do what is interesting and exciting to you first and figure out the money later. Uh, and that sounds, again, that sounds really pat. That sounds like, well, just believe in love and romance and promises kept and you'll find that special someone, right? It, it sounds really, it doesn't sound very useful to anybody. Mm-hmm. And likewise, we can glamorize people who have an attention to detail, who are overly concerned with detail. Uh, Steve Jobs passing recently, you know, that's been a, talked about a lot. Oh, he changed the, he called somebody at Google because of a color of one of the letters in the Google logo. Wow, he was really focused. Um, so we can, we can put a little bit of undue emphasis on this idea of having everything calculated out. Answer somewhere in the middle, probably, right? Yeah, somewhere in between just doing something because it's fun for you to do and you're having a good time doing it because the fun shows and uh, but also being a little bit uh, intentional about what you do and why yeah I, I just wait that's, th that's helpful what's that Jersey I, I, I just was wondering aloud if it took us an hour and a half to two hours to get to that to that one sentence <laughs> <laughs> well I mean it's way easy to, uh, to, to you know bust out a uh, a summary statement for that kind of thing, but uh, there's there's a lot of interesting details uh, beneath it, and so we, we took a swing at exploring it. But it's uh, it's not like that attempt at exploring it is really uh, 
meant to be prescriptive or uh, assumptive of that, or that it's complete and uh, and all encompassing. Um, but uh, but it touches on a lot of things I think um, that are uh, establishes well common very common among those of us that that make stuff. Yeah. And so and so we go on fighting. Yeah. Back into the fight. Back okay. The well, I, I you know I I feel like we got to the the fairly deep into this one and it's getting harder and harder for me to talk. So no it's probably a good idea to wrap it up. So um. We slipped and fell down that hill of information. Now we're all <laughs> mucked up and bruised at the bottom. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And I still got a little bit of chest congestion going on on top of it all. Mm -hmm. uh, so we should throw out one more thing about 30 classes in 30 days at leanintoart.com. If you're interested in signing up for some of the time-shifted courses, uh, what do you get? Do you get, do you get everything? Like if you sign up for the silver level, you get all 30. Silver level fact, is yes. all 30. And bronze um, level is fifteen. Correct. Um, and uh, it's, uh, I mean, yeah, it, it's a lot of classes. I mean, we did this as as a uh, a, an, a fun way to kick off, lean into art, and uh, show the world what what we what we have to offer. And uh, being a part of it is definitely a, a, an art challenge because um, we we prepared for quite some time for. Uh, those of you interested in coming in as a, uh, a participant and, and student of these classes, uh, to get really, um, well, the old drink from the fire hose kind of model, right? Obviously, there's a lot of information coming at you. Cool classes yeah. every single day. Um, that you you can you know go with them live. Uh, there, there's a few that are just destined to be time shifted for everybody. But uh, they're mm -hmm. even less than we initially planned. I mean, we thought it would be close to half and half. So even gold, it would be roughly 15 to 20. But um, as it turns out, when, or in our schedule, uh, those, those of you that are part of, part of gold or want to join that, it's, uh, there's live classes just about every day of the month. Yeah. Which is a lot. And, but it's fun at the same time. So. Super fun. I'm having a good time. Yeah, I want to make this my day job. I mean, that was the greatest thing in the world. Is like like getting up at nine o'clock in the morning on Saturday. I think it was nine. Yeah, uh, or t it was Sunday. Sunday, I got up at nine o'clock in the morning, took a quick shower, lazily or, or you know casually had my coffee, read the news, mm -hmm. went downstairs, taught a class, came back upstairs, had breakfast. Like this is the this is the best. That was so much fun. I got to talk about comics with a whole bunch of people and like do a class, but that I didn't have to leave my home. Help us make this our day job. <laughs> Yeah, and there you go. There's some extra transparency for you there. Uh, no doubt, uh, if um, you're you're into this and you're you know, you're curious, you want to support it, uh, by all means, do. Um, we're we're sh we're showing you what we're interested in doing to uh, help um, help serve this community of of um, uh, you know largely um, artists that are interested in learning in various modes. I mean, you may have uh, you may have gone to art school. You may have not. You may have studied some other topic um, and then are just interested in how um, exercising those creative muscles are it, it's it's handy for a lot of different a lot of different things um, this is a good place for it that's what yeah we've got I mean there was interest it's there's an interesting variety if you surf that list of um, classes that that are just part of our start um, anything from comics to uh, turning Using comics as a present premise for designing a video game. To um, I mean, some of our labs are going to be very, um, you know, HTML coding flavored as far as their kickoff. We'll see what where that goes because a lot of people had those kinds of questions from the um, uh, using storytelling to make your comic UI awesome class, which leads to oh cool. Well, if I if I have this design for my digital comic, how do I build it? Well, cool. Let's talk about that in the lab. Um, yeah. And yet, of course, we're going to be expanding our curriculum, delving into that area as well with an official class. Uh, not yet. We, we've got our hands full with 30 classes in 30 days right now. But, you know. Um, yeah. 
lot of, a lot of neat stuff in there. So yes, cool. lean into art dot com. And mm-hmm. then if you can't, even if you can't be part of it, you can tell a friend. That'd be super cool. Uh, if you're just enjoying the podcast, another thing I'd like to throw at you is uh, give us a re- uh, star review on iTunes. That'd be really helpful. If you think this this material is worthwhile for other artists, a great way to help us become more visible to other artists who might be interested in this kind of material is just giving us a star re- rating on iTunes. Uh, just you know, however many stars you think we deserve. Uh, we don't have any. I think we got like one rating on there right now. So. Oh, yeah. awesome! Cool. Thank you to <laughs> for whoever rated us. Um, <laughs> that's awesome. Um, yeah, that's it's yeah, a new show. It's gonna take time. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> it's been awesome. The the response that uh, we've received so far, emails and uh, you know tweets on Twitter and stuff, that rocks. Super appreciated. Um, that uh, that helps as well. Um, but yeah, the iTunes is a really direct way where it's like you know you're 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 planning on uh, taking a class later or what have you, but uh, you want to give us that kind of uh, hey, good job and uh, yeah, spread the word through iTunes. Thank you. Yeah, that's where there's a focused audience looking for podcasts. So, mm-hmm. gosh, good conversation, Rob. I apologize for all the times you had to vamp while I was leaning off camera to uh, make gross noises <laughs> with my with my face. <laughs> well, you've got a well tuned uh, setup there. There's uh, there's um, very little um, uh, gross comedy in the podcast. <laughs> That was a terrible way to describe what I was doing. I was blowing my nose, everybody, for those who aren't watching the video. Uh, but make gro- making gross noises with your face. I, I, I remember I was once complaining on Twitter uh, about somebody, about people. There was like this this outbreak of people eating on podcasts all of a sudden. Like it was like a year ago. It's like it seemed like every podcast I was listening to, somebody was eating uh, while they were recording, and and I don't know why they did that, except to like the only the only reason I can think of is like I'm just so busy. I gotta fit in lunch and podcasting at the same time. Like, dude. Eat before or after. Don't eat. And then I said on Twitter, I said, uh, you're, you're mashing food in a moist orifice in front of a microphone. Who wants to listen to that? <laughs> and I got a lot of like negative at tweets at me like, oh, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for describing eating that way. We didn't need that. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's, that's, the, that's the fastest way to get me to unsubscribe from a podcast is eat on the podcast. It do, it's not cool. It, it doesn't make me feel good. It just it just irritates me because I get to hear you. It's like you're munching your food in my ear because I have earbuds on, dude. I'm not listening over any kind of speakers in a house where that, that noise will get diffused. Oh, Sure. So anyway, yes, I'm, I'm very like conscious of that. Stuff. Some animal that? got into it. It would still sound like in, 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 a noise in your house would be like uh, there's, a, there's a beast attacking the trash can or something. Yeah. <clears throat> it's all the eating noises, but... <laughs> Anyway, sorry. We had to get that last little uh, missive in there. Okay, well, good talk, Rob. Uh, yeah, Rob Stenzinger of in- interactive-storyteller.com and Rob Stenzinger on the Twitters, Rob Stenzinger on Google+, Rob uh, artgeekzoo.posterous.com. Uh, yeah, that's where the Polytechnic cast is. And, uh, yeah, and of course, artgeekzoo.com is where my comic is. And, uh, yeah, thank you, Jersey Droz of um, comicsaregreat.com and uh, your Jersey Droz or Jersey on Twitter, the super slick short name. Uh, <laughs> I got in early. Yeah. Thank so, you. Yep. Good conversation. Well, fun times. All right. Well, we'll see you next time, everybody. Okay. Bye.